Welcome to Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com. We thank them for their sponsorship. There's a reason we love having them as part of this show. LegacyPMInvestments.com. Coming up, of boys and men. As a young girl growing up in the 70s, I grew up in the era of Title IX, and I was given lots of encouragement to pursue my dreams and be athletic and, you know, work on math and STEM and all these things. And the future was bright for women, and my dad encouraged it, and my mom encouraged it. My brother, it was already baked in, right? He was a male growing up in the 70s, and of course the opportunities were there. Well, this is 2022, just heading into 2023. And it seems as though while we've continued to empower girls and women as we should, maybe we've disempowered men and boys. Maybe there's a reason that the number of suicides in men is going up. There is a gender gap. The script is flipped. Is that a good thing? If you got a son, or a brother, or a nephew, or any other young male, heck, any age male in your life that you love, you should want them to succeed just as much as you want girls to succeed. I've got one son and one daughter, and I have the same hopes for both, but some of the statistics out there are dire, and we're going to jump into them and talk about why this is. Why are boys suddenly feeling useless and worthless? Richard V. Reeves of the Brookings Institution discusses it with us with his new book of boys and men that is next for nearly three decades she's reported the action from the sidelines she started very young she's covered the nba nfl olympics and the college football and basketball national championships and now during these insane times in our world michelle tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. So, Richard, as I was telling the audience before I brought you in, there are so many works that you've done that I am fascinated by. And I I, I was on your webpage and I see the John Stuart Mill book. I see the Dream Hoarders, the 80 Minute Uh, MBA. For someone that actually spent two years getting a master's in business, I, I wish I had just gotten the 80 minute MBA. It would probably have been a lot cheaper. I, I could have saved you a lot of time. <laughs> a lot of time and a lot of money. A lot of money. Um, but today I'm interested in your, uh, this is your most recent book of boys and men because I have a son and I think you have three, right? Right. How old are your yeah. sons? They're all now in their 20s. So they range uh, 21, 22, and 26. Oh, you had a you had quite a childhood of uh, at yeah. some point that must have been one heck of a household. It well, was the, the, for a while. Yeah. The subtitle is "Why the Modern Male Is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It." I guess I'd ask you first why you chose to wrote the, write this book. Well, I work a lot on issues of inequality, employment, family policy, broadly around you know, what are the barriers to people flourishing in society, whether that's class or geography or race or whatever. And But increasingly, I just kept stumbling across growing evidence that we should be really paying a lot more attention to the problems of boys and men, which is a counterintuitive uh, approach, maybe. I think we're used to saying, look, there are problems of women and girls. And of course, there are still many problems facing women and girls. But increasingly in education, employment, family life, I was seeing a lot of boys and men who are on the wrong end of a lot of the trends, the recent social and economic trends of recent years. And the second reason is that I didn't think that we were having a very good quality debate about the problems of boys and men for all kinds of political and institutional reasons. It felt like it was just a, it was a difficult subject for people to talk about in a kind of open and frank and straightforward way. It gets immediately freighted with lots of personal issues, political issues, etc. And so I guess you could say that it was a, a difficult area that I, I felt was somewhat neglected. And certainly in public policy and in discussion, I didn't feel like it was getting the right kind of attention. Let's put it that way. I, sadly, I think that so many important issues aren't getting real honest debate these days. And that is a tragedy in and of itself. But this one 
I remember being interviewing a panel of um, corporate executives and they were talking about the need to diversify, have diversity, equity, inclusion, and all the rest. And I kind of stupidly said, you know, I have a son and while I'm Hispanic, his dad is very white Dutch. <laughs> so <laughs> is my son going to maybe be excluded because we're including others and they just nearly booed me off the stage. So, but at the same time, my son now, as I'm sure your sons went through, he's applying for colleges. I know it's going to be tough for him because he's a white male, right? So when you talk about being on the wrong end of a lot of uh, issues and, and, and we see a lot of male suicide numbers going up, which specifically are you referring to? Well, let's start with education, because I think college is a great place to start where you, you were just mentioning it. And and the extraordinary uh, and overtaking uh, is the best way to put it of, of uh, men by women in the last few decades. So US college campuses now are 60, 40, female, male. And the gap is bigger today. The gender gap today is, is bigger than it was in 1972 when Title IX was passed, it's just the other way around. So 1972, men were about 13 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree than women. The US government passed Title IX and, was been, and has been spending money and political capital to try and increase gender equality. But what no one expected was what happened next, which was that we didn't, get to, we didn't just get to equality. The lines kept going so that now women are 15 percentage points more likely than men to get a four-year college degree. And so that's a wider gap than in 1972, it's just flipped the other way around. And to some extent, that reflects what's happening much earlier in the education system. You, you know, you have a son, you don't need me to tell you that there are many ways in which the education system is not as male friendly as it is female friendly. And one result of that is that among those with the highest GPAs, the top 10%, two thirds of those are girls. So if you're interested in selective colleges in particular, the fact that you know, you've got for every every one boy getting a high GPA, you've got two girls, uh, is hugely important when it comes to college admissions. So, in some ways, we shouldn't be surprised at the gap on campuses because it reflects the gaps that that come before. The only, the only other thing I'll say is a slight amendment I would say to what you said earlier, which is that in the U.S., because of the history of the U.S., actually black boys and men are typically the worst off on most of the measures that we're interested in, followed by working class men of all, of all race. And that, and that is different to other countries. The UK, where I'm from, it's very much a white working class issue. Okay. Um, but in the US, it remains the case that black boys and men are really in trouble. And that's so aggravating. Um, and, and as much as the education system tries to compensate and make, you know, um, make things more equal, if you will, tries to force this, it seems to be working against us still. W why do you suppose women have g higher GPAs? What What is that about? I think the GPA is a really good measure of a whole range of skills, a lot of which are about organization, timeliness, future orientation, uh, a bit of the brain that's called the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and there's all kinds of names for this bit of the brain, the CEO of the brain, uh, sometimes people talk about non, you know, non cognitive skills, executive functioning, whatever you want to call it. I call it the bit of your brain that, that makes sure you turn in your chemistry homework. <laughs> it's the bit of your brain that remembers you have chemistry homework that takes your chemistry homework home, that does your chemistry homework, that takes it to school, that turns it in, that, that realizes you have a chemistry class, right? <laughs> and girls are just like way ahead. Everyone who's had boys or girls knows that girls are just way more developed in those skills than boys are. And GPA is as much about that as it is about smarts. So there's actually no evidence for a difference in intelligence between boys and girls. It's not true that girls are smarter than boys or that boys are smarter than girls. Those are both myths. But it, but it is true that girls are more, are more advanced, partly because they're just their brains develop earlier in that turning in your homework thing. You know, I remember with my, my, try, trying to explain to my own son what the A in GPA stood for as he started to get his act together in junior year. And I said, well, but your GPA in your freshman year of high school was 1.9. <laughs> and so the, the A is an average. And so, you know, whereas, you know, none of his, none of his female friends got a 1.9 GPA in, in their freshman yeah. year of high school. Um, they were on it. And interestingly, as colleges move, of course, away from standardized tests, 
in their admissions. That's likely to widen the gender gap still further because there's no gender gap on standardized tests like the SAT or ACT, but there's a very big one on GPA. That is so interesting as my son is preparing to take the ACT and studying for it. Meanwhile, my daughter is 14 and yes, she's generally responsible, but lately she's been more responsible to tuning into Harry Styles concerts that are being <laughs> streamed live on her phone than she is to her science uh, homework. So we got, we got to make an adjustment there. But, <laughs> you know, when it comes to Harry Styles, what are you going to do? What are you um, going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? So, <laughs> so it, am I right about the suicide numbers that we yes. are seeing men increasingly just, I, I mean, th that reflects such a despondence, such a hopelessness, such a frustration mm -hmm. with life, such a, 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 a low measure of oneself and their place in the world. What's going on? Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's, the suicide rate is between three and four times higher among men than among women. So it's four times higher among younger men, um, for example. And it's been, and it's rising. So it's gone up by about 50% in the last two or three decades. Meanwhile, things like homicide rates have, have gone down very significantly. So we've become a much less violent society over the last few decades, but at the same time, a much more dangerous one in terms of people taking their own life. And there it's interesting, the story about race and class is a bit different there because it's actually white working class men who are at the greatest danger of taking their own lives. Um, uh, there are differences by, by race and class, and, but the big, the big one is gender. And interestingly, uh, just picking up on your point about worthlessness or despair or so-called deaths of despair, which include suicide, but also opioids, where men, again, about 70 right. to 75% of opioid deaths, alcohol-related illnesses. There's a researcher by the name of Fiona Shand who did a very nice study which looked at the words that men had used to describe themselves before attempting or committing suicide. And the two most commonly used words were worthless and useless before men committed suicide. And, and so it seems to me that the, those suicide rates, along with some of these other deaths of despair more generally, are really a kind of very strong leading indicator of some underlying problems here, which is a lot of men feeling dislocated, despairing, not needed, not wanted. Like if you don't feel that there, there's any use for you, that there isn't any worth to you, then I think that explains a lot of what's going on in suicides. And so, yeah, we need better mental health, we, et cetera, et cetera. But we've also got to look at the underlying causes, which do seem to be about this sense of who needs me anymore? Am I, am I still needed? And too many of our men don't feel needed and too many of our boys feel neglected. Uh, that's just heartbreaking. And I have two theories about it, which I will share with you right after this break. You know, it is the holiday season, but a lot of people are nervous and not so cheerful about their financial and economic outlook. And Oh, we are all feeling it everywhere at the grocery store, at the gas pump. We look at our 401ks, our IRAs, and we think, oh, 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 what is happening? Well, there is one good piece of news, and it has to do with legacy precious metals. I would encourage people to look into buying precious metals. This is a great time to do it. Gold is a hedge against inflation. It protects against a weakening dollar. It's the only thing that does that for you. The stock market cannot do that for you. So gold is a really good idea to have somewhere in your investment portfolio. And the folks that I trust, legacy precious metals. And I trust them because the first thing they do is they educate you on how much or how little you may want to invest and how it all works. And so, you know, this harkens back to 2008. And if you remember that, whew, that was a rough time. And people who invested in gold saw some huge gains and others lost their retirements. So maybe you don't want to waste any more time. Just pick up the phone and call Legacy Precious Metals. Here is the number. It's 866-528-1903. 866-528-1903. You can also just go download their free investor's guide. You'll find that at LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com. We really appreciate their sponsorship. There's a reason we love having them as part of Sideline Sanity, and we hope you'll give them a shout and let them help you out with your long-term investments. We're talking with Richard Reeves of the Brookings Institution, an author of so many wonderful books. You can find out more at his website, richardvreeves.com. Also, check him out at, at brookings.edu. Um, 
you were talking about men feeling worthless and youth, useless and that, and these deaths of despair. And it's so, so troubling to me. And a couple of thoughts that I had, and I've had them for a while, men lately in the last decade, maybe five years, 10 years are being told about toxic masculinity and that, you know, there's been this sort of feminization of men, or when you have the prime minister of Canada going out and saying the future is feminine and making women seem more meaningful to life or useful than men. Um, we have men going off to fight, whether it's in the Ukraine or Afghanistan or wherever, and coming home and maybe not being tended to. And then we also have, Richard, this decline in the bigger picture, like there's something bigger than just us, this lack of, uh, we have a much more secular society, I think worldwide, but particularly here in America than we have in the past. And so this, this sense of belonging to something bigger than oneself, I think has diminished as well. And when people don't feel proud of their country or they're telling, you know, white men that they're worthless or black men that they're worthless or that, that, that I, I think some of these messages You'd like to believe that people are strong enough to say, screw the messages. I'm going to decide for myself what I'm about. But it, it takes some structure to, to give men that, that sense of, of self that they need. I, I'm just yeah. Van yeah. venting here, but what do you think? Yeah, that's so interesting. I, I do think that the emphasis on the structural or cultural environment that you've just been really pointing is hugely important. There's a tendency to just blame men for what's ever happening to them. Some of that is sometimes it's toxic masculinity, but also sometimes you get a sense, and I would say this is probably true more from the conservative right, which is just right, just be, be men like your dad were, right? Um, be the head of the household in the same way that was true a generation ago. And the problem with that is it doesn't fit with the modern economic realities. Right? The modern economic reality is a world where 40% of women earn more than the typical man. 40% of breadwinners are women. And that's all quadrupled over the last, those numbers have quadrupled in the last few decades. So we're in a new world in terms of the role of men and women. But I do think what's happened, and here I agree with you that there's this very positive script for, for women now, which is you can be anything, you can do any, you know, there's this whole range of choices available to you. You go girl, the future's female, empowerment, et cetera, right? And that's, in many ways, it's been a really wonderful development and, uh, you know, my own, certainly my own generation of women have hugely benefited from that, including my wife, et cetera. By comparison to the generation before, just huge benefits to them. But what's the script for men? What's the positive narrative about being male? And what's happened, I've, I'm afraid, is that people have made the mistake of thinking that in order to be pro-women, you have to somehow say women are better than men or be anti-male or say there's something wrong with men. And then we've lacked this positive script for, for masculinity. Um, so we've torn up the old script for masculinity, but we haven't replaced it with anything positive, which could capture some of the good things about the old script, right? There's, there was many good things about the old script, but also adapt to the world as it is now, right? I do need a different script from, from the one my father had and that my, that my sons are going to have. The world is different now. But it doesn't mean that some of the traditional masculine virtues aren't still important mm -hmm. and that we shouldn't celebrate them. And that's the problem is that who's actually celebrating those positive virtues. And last thing I'll say is on church is it's interesting that uh, in every Christian denomination, except one actually in the U S and you're right, the decline is stronger in the U S but from a higher base, there are more women than men in those churches. And you can go to pretty much any church and you look around you, how many men are in there on their own? There's quite a lot of women in there on their own. The men are there with the women. Um, and so there's, there's, there's this kind of gap, a gender gap in church attendance now. So it's not just that there's been a decline, but it, it's, it's women in our churches, uh, not men. Uh, and so even those institutions have fewer men in them than they used to in the past. And so I, again, what, what's going on there? What, it is, what is it about men's lives that makes it harder for them to remain in these institutional anchors? Wow, I didn't know that about men in church, but you know, I, I was just picturing my own church, which I don't go to nearly enough, so maybe I haven't noticed. <laughs> but uh, the, and that's why I bring it up. I, 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 you know, there's a lot of self examination going on. I'm looking at my kids' futures, and I'm thinking, what's it going to be like for her? What's it going to be like for him? I think you're spot on with this idea that the script for women is just bold and beautiful, and yes, and I benefited from it certainly. 
But yeah. what about the script for men? They're being told they're part of this patriarchy that is oppressive and and all of the rest. But they're the problem, right? There's this, there's this the great problem. line, yeah, that, that that women have problems and men are problems. <laughs> Uh, I, I and, mean, I, and I think I, that's true. I think is that, and I actually walked along the high school corridor with you know my youngest son actually, and, and it was covered with posters for w female scholarships and you know girls on the run and you know women into STEM and so on. There's a whole wall of of posters around it, and he said, you know, the thing is, Dad, that actually this school like twice as many of the girls go, go to selective schools, twice as many of them get the highest AP, and I, you know, because we looked at the numbers, I, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I said, how does this make you feel? He said, look, I don't, I said, I, I'm all about that. It's fine for women to have it. But, but like, where am I, where am I in this story? And the presumption is, well, you don't need a story because the patriarchy, because mm -hmm. men have always been on top. And so I have, I have sons that have been raised in institutions where the girls and the women have always been ahead. Yeah. I, you know, I've had to explain to them that there used to be a world where Women weren't always ahead in education, right? Yeah. They're like, oh, really? I said, yeah, when I went, it was about equal. And when, and when your grandparents went, it was massively the other way around. Yeah. Like, huh, because it's just the norm for them. They know that absolutely boys are going to be second rank throughout school and college. That's, they, they, they just absolutely, and, and yet, and yet they see all this emphasis on girls and women in their schools and almost nothing for boys and men. And, and back to the point about script, when they did their social emotional learning classes you know, to learn about relationships, I said, what did you learn? And they said, we learned a bunch of things that we were supposed to not do and say. Literally all, all it was about, but important stuff for sure about consent and respect yeah. and so on. But it's, they said literally, I said, they said it was literally just, they came home with a list of 17 things that as boys and men, they should never do or say. Okay. But and did you learn anything about what you should do? <laughs> no, <laughs> there's literally nothing positive about it. It was, so the message they came away from implicitly or explicitly is like, just don't be bad. Don't be toxic. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a harasser. Don't be a predator, et cetera. That's it. And I think we could all agree. Like we, I'm sure you would say that to your son too, right? Not least because it's not a very good way of being in the world. Right. But if there isn't also a positive aspect to the story, no wonder our boys are floundering. Again, I it, this is kind of heartbreaking to to talk to you about this because I think about all these boys and this this sense of maybe even some confusion about like what the what the hell am i doing then you know so you do say in your book that there are st there are things we can do mm -hmm. so let's finish with that so that maybe we can all take a step you know in the right direction after we listen here today and and find a little glimmer of hope what do you what do you think needs to be done well, I think as parents, we can just recognize some of these differences on average between our kids. Don't fall into the toxic masculinity trap right. of don't tell your boys just not what to do and recognize that they are different in some important ways. As policymakers and as community leaders and as institutions, uh, I'm very keen on the idea of giving boys an extra year before starting school for the reasons we talked about earlier. An extra year they, of they, actual of secondary school or a year no, between? Pre -K. Uh, just start, oh, them, extra... start them a year later. Yeah, because... Okay because they develop later. Okay. Um, I think that would be important. I think I, I'm really astonished by the fact that we're not doing more to get more male teachers into our classrooms. I mean, we're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And the teaching profession is becoming steadily more female. It's now 76% female wow. uh, down, you know, yeah. Um, uh, uh, only one in 10 elementary school teachers now are men. There are essentially oh, no early goodness. years teachers. And actually, everybody should worry about that. Whether you're a, you know, if you're a feminist, you should worry about that because what message are you sending to the next generation about male and female roles? If you're worried yeah. about boys, you should worry about that. And if you're worried about the labor market, you should worry about that because we have a teacher shortage and men looking for jobs. So that's the kind of thing we should be really be pushing for. I think, and the last thing on education is a lot more investment in vocational learning, more applied yeah. forms of learning, apprenticeships. More, yeah. I've, I've urged the creation of a thousand new technical high schools which would probably cost the federal government about $5 billion a year, which is 1% of the cost of canceling student debt. Uh, so it's like, I'm, I'm going to say it's a better use of our money. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go out there on a limb and say, that is whatever brilliant. you think about canceling student debt for like 1% of that, I can double the number of American kids at technical high schools. Oh and my gosh. And that's very, very pro male with some subsidies from the federal government and the states would kick in. But like, we only have 7% of our students right now in technical high schools. There's huge demand, they're oversubscribed yeah. and boys benefit the most. And that seems to me to be a feature of that policy, not a bug. The fact that our boys are struggling in mainstream education means that if we 
if we have policies that are going to help boys especially, then we should be all for them uh, in terms of getting closer to gender equality. And the last thing I'll talk about is the huge importance of fatherhood, responsible, engaged fatherhood, giving fathers oh more rights, giving them access. I'm, a, I'm an advocate of paid leave. Obviously, that's a very political question about paid leave. But I think if we're going to have paid leave, fathers should get it as much as mothers. And unmarried fathers get treated very badly by the legal and child support systems. And so yeah. I just think culturally an emphasis on fatherhood is missing. So many of these men, to come back to where we were a moment ago, saying they're useless or worthless, is because they're not meeting traditional standards of success, perhaps. Right? They're struggling in the labor market. They struggled in school. Maybe they're struggling with addiction. But if they have kids, by God, do they matter? Oh. There is not a single father here who is worthless or useless. Your kids need you regardless of what condition you're in. And we need to send that message to every father loud and clear. And we need public policy to get behind our dads. Oh, so well said. Again, you want to, I just want to encourage people to get your book of boys and men, why the modern male is struggling, why it matters and what to do about it. And clearly my dog Jersey in the background agrees yes. wholeheartedly. He's I a could male. hear the agreement. I, yes. I, well, my, do my dog was barking too, and he's a male. So all the, we have all the male dogs <laughs> who let the dogs out. <laughs> they, we let them out and we let them speak, and they we are vociferous speak. today on they this are, topic. They are. Yeah. It's, Nobody's I, told them that they're toxic yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Except when you bark during a podcast, Jersey, you're a little bit toxic, but that's okay. I'm, I'm willing to accept it. I am so pleased to have finally had you on this podcast. I applaud this this work. It's so important and it's so timely. And I'm so glad you had the courage to do it because honestly, you're right. So many, so much emphasis right now is on empowering women. And it's been that way for a while. And they have flipped the script on boys and we need to have that pendulum swing back a little bit and have boys be important and be uh, both just as important I mean, as anyone. We can do both, right? We can think two thoughts <laughs> at once. And the, the, the future is not female nor is it male, it's for both of us. Like it's if there human. was a world where it was it's for human flourishing. And yes. and we've got surely we've got to a point where we can say that and and not be forced into these false choices between like caring about one or the other. Right? You have a son and a daughter. Yes. I'm pretty sure that you care equally for both of them and you want both of them to flourish. And that's the model for society. Nobody yeah. wants a world where daughters don't have the same opportunities as their sons, right? Nobody wants right. to go back to that. No. But equally, it doesn't mean benching our sons. Right. It doesn't. We can do both. We can do, we can both. do both. Oh, Richard, well, that was a great Reese. conversation. Thank you so much thank, for having me on. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, folks, get the book of Boys and Men, Richard Reeves. Thanks for listening to Sideline Sanity. Be brave and do good. Happy to talk once again with Charles Thorngren, the CEO of Legacy Precious Metals. You know, I think it still is confusing to people, uh, some people, uh, as to why a precious metals investment would be a worthwhile one, particularly at this time when they're thinking, I'm doing all I can to put gas in the car. Why is now a particularly good time? A and we'll go from there to how small of an investment is worthwhile for someone? You know, a great question. And, and I think the, the importance of why really comes into the fact that we have to save for ourselves, whether it's a little here, a little there, whether it's making it a plan and putting out so much a paycheck, whether it's making sure we fund our retirement account, we have to realize we are responsible for ourselves in the long run. <laughs> you mean that no one else is going to ride up and save us, you know, on some white steed? It ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. You know, that, and anyone who's promising to do that is getting ready to take advantage of you in some form or fashion. Yeah. And so, so if, if I'm an investor, a potential investor, and I'm, looking at legacy precious metals and I'm saying to myself, yeah, I, I, this sounds smart. I don't have a lot to spend. What would you tell that person? I would say, do what you can. If you never start, you never get there. So the most important step you can take is saying, I'm going to take care of myself and my family. I'm going to make it a plan. I'm going to take action. I'm going to start in the way that's comfortable for me. That's the important thing. The first step is always the hardest. But once you take that first step, the second step is easier. And then you're moving. And then once you're in motion, it's hard to stop you. 
So that first step, most important step. I always tell people they can call and talk to an IRA expert or, or check out the, the guide that they can download for free, the investor's guide. What, what is the number one question that you get from people who are first time investors? The biggest question I get, is this right for me? That is the question. And that comes from everyone. So, so everyone's asking the same, is this right for me? And yet we're all so unique. And, and yet it, it is a sound investment for just about any portfolio, isn't it? It is. Be, even though we're all unique, that uniqueness is going to tailor the way we begin the investment. OK, but we're all in the same situation. That's the one thing I think we seem to forget in today's society. Whether you agree with somebody or not, we're in this together. America is in this transition that we're in right now. We're dealing with the same issues. Some people like them, some don't. But we're all in it together. Right. So the need is the same. How we prepare and how we invest is what changes from person to person. But we all have that same need. It's a great point. And again, I encourage people to, to, to just make the call, pick up the phone. That step is always the hardest. I'm not sure why that is in any kind of effort that you make in life, whether it's weight loss or exercise or investing some way to better your life. It always seems like that first hurdle is, is the challenge. Uh, but when they call, who, who are they going to talk to? Who, what, what's going to be on the other end of the line for them? Great question. You're going to speak with one of our customer representatives and their job is not to sell you metals, right? We have a much different approach. We're going to answer all your questions. We're going to show you what options you have. And on the rare occasion, this isn't right for you. We're going to say this probably isn't right for you. Um, we have a gold company here, but you know, I, I say it all the time. What we actually deal in is customer service. We want each and every individual that calls to get the answers they need to be able to make the decision that's right for them. And we want to do that in a way that's not pushy, that's not salesy. And, and that's what makes my team so special. We care about each and every caller. And we're going to show you what options you have. And then you get to make an informed decision. So don't be afraid of the phone call. It's the best thing you can do. And this is why I am so honored and I feel privileged to be sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. They're the ones that I'm going to deal with. And I encourage you to pick up the phone, give them a call, even easier. Go check out their, their guide. It's a free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. But as you said, Charles, pick up the phone. You're going to talk to someone who can answer your specific questions and get get the ball rolling, get, get started, do something that is a long-term play for your family's benefit. Charles, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always great to be here.